Good afternoon, my name is Dan Bonnell from NVIDIA. I have the pleasure of introducing Aaron Schumacher from Deep Learning Analytics. He's going to talk today about build and train your first TensorFlow graph from the ground up with Deep Learning Analytics. We have not been reading bios, but it is 3 o'clock on day one of uh, GTC, and I found Aaron's to be uh, particularly compelling, so stay with me here for just about 30 seconds. Uh, Aaron's a senior data scientist and software engineer with Deep Learning Analytics, as I said. Aaron is a, uh, he, he taught Python and R for General Assembly and the Meta Data Science Boot Camp. He's also worked with data at Booz Allen Hamilton, NYU, and the New York City Department of Education. And here it comes. Aaron's career best breakdancing result was advancing to the semifinals in the R16 Korea 2009 individual footwear battle and he's honored now to be the least significant contributor to TensorFlow 0.9. So give it up, please, for Aaron. Thank you. All right, the microphone is working. Excellent. Um, hello, I'm Aaron. Thank you for coming. Uh, there's been a lot of good talks. Uh, hopefully, this one will not be bad. Uh, I put this up just as a little amuse-bouche. This is a quote from something on Wired. Um, Jigsaw then fed the massive corpus of online conversation and human evaluations into Google's open source machine learning software, TensorFlow. And if, if this does not seem kind of funny to you, you are in the right place, because this is a beginner level talk. Um, but this, this is sort of weird. TensorFlow is not a mysterious AI in the mountains, right? Uh, we're not just going to feed it all our data and it'll magically do things. So I, I hope to demystify uh, TensorFlow a little bit and show you some of how it works. Okay. So this is presenting Hello TensorFlow again. I've presented it several times, so hopefully that means this is the best one ever, and, and you get that version. Um, also, though, the last time I presented it, we ran to two hours, so I'm hoping to achieve at least a 4x speed up today. Um, so hopefully NVIDIA will make that happen. I've got jokes, you don't have to laugh. Um, if you want to see any of this in more detail, the whole thing is written up on my blog at planspace.org. Um, and I'm not going to take questions during, but we can do some after, or you can reach me at Plan Space, uh, Plan Aerospace on Twitter. Uh, so I am on the internets. Okay. So like I said, this is presenting Hello TensorFlow, which is this thing that I wrote uh, for O'Reilly, and you can find it all up on the O'Reilly website. It's called Hello TensorFlow. Um, also, if you prefer to read Chinese, you can go read the Chinese version. They translated it into Chinese, which was kind of neat. Um, as a reminder, the classification level for this meeting is unclassified. Um, again, you don't need to laugh at my jokes. Uh, so uh, I do work for deep learning analytics, although I just wear this t-shirt to bring out my eyes. Um, so I want to thank the team at deep learning analytics for supporting the development of this uh, presentation. A lot of other people helped as well, um, but it's a great team and uh, really happy to be a part of it. Also, if you want to see a higher level talk, um, sort of a more sophisticated conceptual talk, uh, two people from our team, Jen and John, are going to be speaking in the same room here tomorrow at 5, so you want to check that out as well. That will be a very cool talk. All right. Uh, another thing that people sometimes wonder about is what's the deal with TensorFlow versus other frameworks, and one that I think about in particular is CAFE. This is just showing development commits on GitHub for CAFE and TensorFlow since TensorFlow was released as open source last year in November. Um, so the point of the graph, of course, is that CAFE is not dead. All right, so into TensorFlow. I'm going to talk about two of these things in detail, but I'll introduce all of them. So what is TensorFlow? It has something to do with tensors. It has something to do with flows. Here we are at the GPU conference. Um, also, TensorFlow has this thing to do with pictures and to do with servers. So I'm going to talk mostly about the flows and the pictures, but I'm going to introduce all of this briefly here. So if you have used other neural network software, you may have seen things like um, Python's PyBrain or R's neural net package. And often, you're invited to think in terms of neurons. And there's this uh, sort of train of research that thinks about neurons a lot. Um, but TensorFlow doesn't very much, right? TensorFlow says, really, the neurons don't exist, per se. What exists are the numbers that represent the weights connecting different things um, and the data. And so we're going to think in terms of matrices or, in general, tensors. And so that's the, the viewpoint that TensorFlow has. You can still use the TFLearn um, contributed 
stuff in TensorFlow and get some of that neuron-based uh, API. Uh, but for the most part, we're going to have matrices and have to think about linear algebra. But for this talk, no linear algebra. So good if you don't want to do linear algebra. Next, flows. Um, you'll see right away, anytime you look at TensorFlow, they say, we have a computation flow graph. Right? And um, the graph, of course, is not a graph of data in the usual sense, like a pie chart or something, um, but this kind of abstract data type graph. Right? So if you look at this, it might seem sort of weird to represent this way, but you can look at it and say, oh, this is y equals mx plus b. Right? So this is the way that TensorFlow is thinking of your computation as a graph. Right? So the inputs, the, the operations, everything is going to be nodes on a graph that are connected by what feeds into what. OK, so I'm going to spend some time talking about this because it's interesting the way that TensorFlow manages this graph and uses it uh, to figure out what you want to do. OK, of course, GPUs. I was going to change this presentation to include more about how to get TensorFlow to run on GPUs, but it's just so easy. Um, so I'm just putting in this picture. It's a GPU. Uh, but this is a great feature of TensorFlow. With no work, TensorFlow will take any computation that you have and put it on a GPU. So this is very nice. We're going to use the Python API. You don't need to learn any CUDA. Just write it in TensorFlow, and you should be able to push it onto a GPU. It's pretty neat. OK. Another thing, moving on, is pictures. Right? And this means TensorBoard. TensorBoard is this integrated logging and visualization system that TensorFlow has. And it's not the jewel in the crown exactly, but it's this incredibly cool feature that comes along for free with all the rest of TensorFlow. In my opinion, it could be a reason to use TensorFlow in and of itself. If you're used to something like Python scikit-learn, you're doing all your machine learning models, and then separate from that, you have to figure out how to log what's going on and how to visualize what your model is doing. Uh, and it can be difficult or impossible to get at the in internals that you want. With TensorFlow, you get a lot of stuff built in for free and I'm going to spend some time talking about how this works and show how to do it. All right, the last thing from my list of five things was servers. And thanks to Google again, we have this serving architecture that fits with TensorFlow, uh, which is designed for deploying networks. And it is really engineered up to the level that Google wants to do, um, which is pretty good. Um, so this is a cool thing that you might be interested in, might be a reason to go to TensorFlow. But again, I'm not going to talk about this at all. So goodbye this. OK, so I'm going to spend most of my time now in a demo. Here we go, demo. All right, so TensorFlow. I'm going to start just talking about Python and kind of hint at the ideas of TensorFlow by introducing them with Python. Then we'll get into actually doing stuff with TensorFlow. Um, and go all the way through training a single neuron model with gradient descent. Very cool. So one thing that you may or may not know um, when you're using, uh, well, this came from Hadley Wickham, who thinks about R a lot, but also in Python. Uh, when you have an object in Python, and just about everything, really maybe everything is an object, the names that you call them by are separate from the objects, right? So a name kind of points at an object, not the other way around. So example to maybe make this clearer. Uh, let's do this. So I'm going to say everybody's favorite variable name, foo, is going to be an empty list. OK. Really, a lot just happened, by the way, right? Inside my notebook, I've got the whole read, evaluate, print loop happening, right, a REPL. Um, same as if you're at the command line, but here in a notebook. So I typed in some text. I sent that to Python. Python read it. Python thought about what to do with it. Python um, read, evaluate, print. OK, so it gave us some output. There's no output in this case, but it could have. Um, and then it loops back, and we continue doing that, right? So there's a lot happening even when I hit Enter, right? There's an implicit evaluation happening. OK, so anyway, we've done that, and now we have foo. Name refers to this empty list. OK, now I'm going to say bar equal foo, which really assignment operator, right? So now um, bar is assigned to the value of foo. OK, so this makes sense, right? 
Foo equals bar? Yes. Foo is bar? Also yes. Hmm. So what does that mean? Well, it means that foo and bar are just names that point at the same thing. One way to see that, uh, most people will be using the CPython implementation where this will work nicely. The ID of foo and the ID of bar, same thing, right? Python is managing this object. It lives at some address in memory. And Python is also managing these names, foo and bar. And those names both point to the same thing. Uh, you may have encountered weird bugs in your Python. If you have ever changed one list and found that it also changed another list, this is often because they are the same list, right? And you have this two names referring to the same thing problem. Um, so all of this is to say, already with just Python, you have a system that is keeping track of things somewhere um, and giving you access to them via names, right? Uh, and when we start working with TensorFlow, TensorFlow is going to be kind of another level where TensorFlow is managing things in the back end and giving you this Python API to them. OK, so one fun party trick to talk about graphs a little bit. I'm going to do foo.append bar. OK, so it should append bar into foo. OK, I can run it. Um, so now bar is, in, bar is inside foo but also bar is foo, so foo is inside itself. So, so what is it going to look like when I print it out? This is sort of a weird thing to do, right? Um, I don't know, what, what do you expect? Well, let's take a look. Of course, it comes out as dot, 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 right? It is given up. Because this is an infinite recursion, right? It's inside itself, but again, it's inside itself. So it can't print this all out. Um, it's this impossible thing. So you could think of it like this, right? And this is some very simple cyclic graph, right? Where it's pointing to itself. And this way of using lists to represent a graph data structure is one way to represent a, a graph data structure. Uh, it's not necessarily the best or most useful. I mean, it's not at all what TensorFlow is going to do. But this introduces kind of the idea of having a graph that's represented somehow. And we'll see a little bit more about how TensorFlow represents and works with the graph. All right. So this was all just Python. Um, and now we're going to do more Python, but pulling in TensorFlow. OK. So we're going to try and make very simple things so that we can understand them all. This is not what you would do to solve some interesting problem, but it is what you do to kind of look at the little pieces and understand them all. OK, so we import TensorFlow. TensorFlow, of course, is all written in C++, right? So that's all happening somewhere. And we thank the Google engineers for that. But we're just going to use Python here. Um, often, when you import a Python module, that's all you do. And you just get functions or something, right? Maybe class definitions, right? Uh, TensorFlow is actually already managing state. This is kind of interesting. You might not think of that. But TensorFlow, when I just import it, already is managing a default graph. So there's a default graph, and I can get it by saying get default graph. So let's get the default graph. And the graph is all made up of operations. Every node in the graph is an operation. Um, so I can get the operations. How many operations should there be in my graph? Mm -hmm -hmm. There are zero, because we haven't done anything yet. Good. This makes sense. OK, so let's make something in the graph. Uh, you do that in TensorFlow by using these constructor kind of guys. tf.constant will make a constant. I'm going to say the value of the constant should be 1.0, and that's going to have a Python name input value. OK, so I do that. Note that I didn't explicitly say anything about the graph, but the graph has been changed. TensorFlow is managing this. So let's get the operations. How many operations should I have now? There's one. That makes sense, right? I made one constant. Now I have one operation in the graph. Wonderful. So I have an operation. It's in the graph. Cool. We might wonder, what is that? What does it look like? So I can print out the node def. And here is the definition of my constant operation. Uh, you can see, sure enough, here it is. It's a float value 1.0.
Great. Um, it does seem like kind of a lot of work for the value 1.0, um, which you know, maybe it is. But this shows how TensorFlow is using protocol buffers internally. Um, so that's all I want to show here. It looks a little bit like JSON, um, but this is a format. It becomes a binary format, but we're looking at a text representation of it. And you can see that it includes all the information we need for this constant, right? including the type. Right? This is a double. It's a float. That'll be relevant in a second when we look at something else. Um, but in Python, you usually don't specify types. In TensorFlow, you do have to specify types. Um, it was implicit in the constant creation I just did. OK, so look at the input value. Here's some text representation of my input value. Note that it does not tell me what the value is. What? Uh, so this is interesting, and this brings out a point about TensorFlow, which is in TensorFlow, the evaluation of anything in the graph is very explicit, generally. Right? So we define the graph, and that is just defining it, and it doesn't do the evaluate step. Right? So in Python, when you hit Enter, you get an evaluation right away, typically. Um, but here, we have sort of a lazy evaluation kind of thing, where we have to explicitly ask for an evaluation to get a result. The graph defines things. To start evaluating things, we need to make a session. Uh, I'd like to say that the graph is like a blueprint, and the session is like a construction site. So let's make a session. I'm going to do that here. Now I've got a session, and I am going to run in my session the input value, which again is a constant 1.0. I have successfully gotten 1.0 back from my constant. Amazing, right? Particularly because everything I did so far is kind of equivalent to just doing this in Python, right? <laughs> so a little bit of work to set up. Uh, but for more complex problems, this lets TensorFlow do management and intelligently route things around and hopefully give you performance improvements and make other things possible, like moving everything onto a GPU. OK. So I said that in TensorFlow, we don't really think of neurons, um, but my brain still does. So I'm going to make a little baby neuron. It's going to be a very simple neuron. It's not even going to have a, a, a link function or anything. Just going to have an input and a weight, and they'll get multiplied together. OK. So the weight, I'm going to want to change as I learn something. Um, so the weight now is going to be a variable. So just like making a constant, I can make a variable. So let's make a variable. I will set it to a starting value of 0.8. Um, in a real neural network, you might randomly initialize things. I'm just going to say 0.8 because it makes the math nice later. OK. So I made a variable. How many operations do we expect to be in the graph now? This has all been a setup. Because the answer is 5. Uh, so that's maybe surprising. The constant was just one, but the variable's more complicated. So the variable has its own operation, but it also separately stores the initial value. And it's got a separate operation for assigning to it and for reading from it. And if you've thought about distributed systems, maybe you're thinking, oh, that means they can intelligently think about whether there's going to be horrible conditions about this and that. Um, yes. For our purposes, usually we won't ever look at these, um, but we'll just continue using the access that we have via the Python name weight in this case. OK. So, so far, we've got a constant and a variable. Doesn't feel like computation yet. Now we'll finally do a computation. Yes, multiplication. This looks like just normal multiplication from Python, but you have to remember that in Python, you can define your own multiplication. And TensorFlow does that so that when you multiply two TensorFlow things, it's going to modify your graph. So we do that. Now output value refers to what we get when we multiply them. And we can look at the last operation in the graph now. And we see it is multiplication. So that's what I was saying. When we did this multiplication here, though it wasn't obvious, that was changing the graph and adding that multiplication node. OK. You can also look at the inputs and see you get the variable, you get the constant. They're the inputs to the multiplication, which makes sense. Right? This is 
more the way that TensorFlow manages graphs, you know, which is different from what I was showing before with just nested lists, which is this very simple, naive kind of thing to do. Okay. So, can we actually do the multiplication? No. Because we've got the variable, but the variable doesn't have a value yet. It's just sitting there. So we need to initialize our variables. Of course, we don't have an operation that would let us initialize our variables. So we need to make an operation that, in theory, would initialize the variables. Oh gosh, TensorFlow. Why? All right. Luckily, we have this very convenient initialize all variables thing, which does not initialize the variables, but creates an operation that will initialize the variables when we run it. So we do that. Now the operation exists, and I can run that operation. And now, in my session, which I defined earlier, we have a variable that has a value. Great. And now I can run the output value. And we should see, what is it? It's 1 times 0.8, right? So of course, that's 0.8 something something 1. Why? Because type system, right? This is a, a double, not a, a quad, which is what you would usually use in Python, right? So computer science, yeah. All right. So this, so far, has been the so-called forward pass, right? We had an input, and we fed it forward, and we got a result. Um, Wonderful. TensorBoard will let us look at the graph that we've made. I'm going to redefine things so that they have slightly nicer names. I create a summary writer, and I tell it to put the graph into that summary. What that does now is it's going to write into an output directory some protocol buffer stuff, which the TensorBoard executable will be able to read. So we make that. And now I'm going to run TensorBoard. You could do this at the command line. I'm going to run it from here. Give it a second. So TensorBoard is a separate executable that's running. And it is going to look in that output directory that we made. And it's going to create a web app that runs locally. And I can look at it if I go over here. OK, so here it is. Great success. We have a graph. This is fun to click around in and more useful if you have a more complicated graph. Um, but I'm going to keep moving along here. OK. So looking at the graph, one thing you can do with TensorBoard. Right now, I'm going to actually do the learning. Right. This is the backpropagation, right? gradient descent. How does that work? Here we go. We're going to make the true value that we want the result to be. We're going to say it's 0. right? Right now, we're getting 0.8, which is not 0, so it's wrong. So we hope to have it learn and get better at equaling 0. So true value. Now we define a loss. It's going to be the squared loss, which everybody loves. And I create an optimizer. It's a gradient descent optimizer. It has a learning rate so that we don't take giant steps everywhere. And I can compute that. This is showing what's going on and making you think of high school calculus, right? Here's the loss. And when the output is 0.8, it has some value. Uh, and the slope is something. And TensorFlow can calculate what that gradient is. So again, I'm going to initialize variables. And now I'm going to look at what is the gradient that it's getting. It's 1.6, which hopefully makes sense because we can do derivatives. Um, so it should be 1.6. Great. Thank you, TensorFlow. Once we have the gradient, we can then push it back and make updates to our variables. We're going to do that here. So now we've gone forward and we've gone backward. This is sort of one step of the learning algorithm. So we can look at what is the weight now. We see that. It's not exactly because of floats, but it's close to 0.76. And this is because, as we wanted, it said learning rate times gradient. Subtract that from the old value. Boom. We are doing gradient descent. It's possible to look at this and understand every value in here. As soon as you have a real model, you will not want to calculate all the gradients yourself. 
Thank you, TensorFlow, for taking care of that. All right, so I'm going to try and go quickly to finish this. We can do a training step. We can do 100 training steps. And sure enough, now it is close to zero. We learned. Wonderful. You can do diagnostics sort of the lazy way, just by printing them out. But again, TensorBoard gives you a better way. I'm going to skip the details of that so I can get to the final version. This guy right here is going to do the same model. It's going to do 100 steps of training, and it's going to log into TensorBoard the values of everything that I have all the way through. And we'll be able to look at it in TensorBoard so that we can see as soon as it starts up. There we go. Now we can look at, for example, how the output decreases as we train and how the loss also decreases as we train. You can see that it decreases more quickly because it's squared. Um, hooray for squaring things that are less than one. Uh, and the point here is that it's easy to instrument your model and look at what's going on all the way through training, uh, which is pretty great. Uh, the powers are all very accessible. And sorry I didn't have time to explain in more detail how that all works. Uh, but again, the full details are online. And thank you. Thank you very much. I think we have time for just one question. If there's a quick question. Otherwise, would you be available in the back if anybody yeah, wants yeah, to for talk sure, with you? Yeah, for sure. I'll, so I'll be around. Transition. Thank you very much. Um, right. And again, you can get the more complete details online. Excellent. Thank you, everybody.